Welcome, welcome students, welcome editors. Uh, hello and welcome to an open session of writing about global science for the international media. Um, this is our first editor's night that we've had in this class since uh, the pandemic. And the first in-person one anyway. And before March 2020, it was a tradition in my class to invite students to meet some of the talented editors that I work with uh, and to find out how they got to do what they do and how they got to do it. But then came the pandemic and editor's night became a really minor casualty of a worldwide calamity. And um, it was a tragedy as we all lived it. And um, it was also the biggest science story of our lifetime. Um, if anything good came of it, the importance of good and clear science communication was the thing that we learned. Because we saw when there was bad science communication, there were deaths and there wasn't good policy. So what we're going to do tonight is meet eight editors who will talk about what they do and how they did it, but also editors, if you could address the question of what we've learned because of the pandemic about science communication beyond its critical importance. Um, our first speaker is John Rennie, who is, I'm proud to say, my editor at Quanta Magazine. He brilliantly covers biology, physics, mathematics at Quanta. And Quanta, if you don't know it, is a new online magazine started by the Simons Foundation, but most importantly by a lot of my colleagues from the, formerly from the New York Times. Um, and uh, Quanta is so good that it won the Pulitzer Prize this year. Um, and if you don't subscribe, subscriptions are free, and I really urge you to take a look at it because it's just wonderful. John, before joining Quanta, was the editor-in-chief of Scientific American. So uh, John, what are you doing different in terms of science communication now than you did before the pandemic? Uh, okay, that's a good question. What's doing different? Uh, I mean, the, the, the odd thing is that makes it a little harder to answer that question is that like a lot of journalists, you know, there was a process of steadily working right through it all, whereas there are so many occupations where people had to be laid off uh, or go into some sort of suspension, however involuntarily, so that it was clear to have a kind of before and after. Um, for me, and I suspect for pretty much everybody else here, there was a kind of change of venue, perhaps, and change of circumstances, but we all just kept doing it. So a lot of the changes kind of have blurred together, but I would say that at least one thing that um, we, I think all of us are very aware of now as a result of having seen how things have played out with the pandemic is just the, the fact of that the pr providing the right kind of context for information is constantly extremely important. And that that context isn't just limited as a lot of us might have once thought um, discussions of science to just things about um, the, the scientific information itself, but I think you, we really oftentimes have to think about how some of the communications that we're doing are landing with people in different cultural sets uh, from different sort of political orientations and Given that we live in a time when it's been very, very clear that um, all information uh, can be made mischievous, that's the most benign possible way I could possibly put that, um, that it's very important for us to try to be very, very clear about what things mean and why they mean what they mean. And in some cases, you know, you can't, we can't, we can't make it possible for people to prove all the science that we are covering all the time. At some level, there's a point where they have to be able to kind of accept a certain level of the, the, the information, the conclusions that are being reached by experts. But what we can do is we can try to at least outline something about the thought process, and we, I think we can hope that some of that will make some of the information 
um, that we're presenting maybe not be beyond reproach, but, but beyond simple reproach? There's a long-winded short answer to well, speaking of your alma mater, Scientific American, Sarah Lewin Frazier edits the advances section of Scientific American and uh, in the print section, but she also edits online news. Um, before that, you were an associate editor of space.com. Uh, and before you joined Siam, which is as preeminent a magazine in, in our field as you can you can know about. Um, you were associate editor space.com where you covered the cosmos and humans thrusting in it. So uh, are you doing things differently since the pandemic? Let yeah, me um, you know, the very last messages of things that were still entirely analog at the magazine had to go digital, like, you know, the giant proofs uh, that we, you know, most of that has gone by the wayside, but there still were physical proofs that we were doing um, are now, unfortunately, PDFs, and they're much more boring looking. Um, but in terms of uh, you know, coverage, I think we've just continued doing a really good job of covering health, and that's sort of just taken over our health editor's job for a couple years is solely COVID stuff. Something that is interesting I wanted to mention is that I um, supervise the interns and the fellows and for a couple of years now, I've been getting so many applications saying that people saw how important science communication is because of the pandemic. Um, people inspired to go into health writing in particular, science writing, especially like a lot of scientists transitioning into science writing because of that, um, which I think is really interesting. Actually, this year, they all switched back to being um, environment. They're done worrying about health. Now they're, they think the environment is you know, needs to be communicated about urgently, which I wouldn't dispute. But um, I just like, I do think that the, we were always motivated by providing, you know, important and accurate information to people, but the pandemic makes that even clearer, more important. And other people are, you know, especially people getting into science writing are really motivated by that too, which makes me really happy. Sarah, how did you get into it? Uh, in a very boring way, I guess. No, so I actually, like, <laughs> literally two of the other panelists I had as professors. So, um, uh, Corey Dean was a visiting professor when I was at Brown. Uh, and I took a science writing class. Um, and John Rennie at NYU's Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program. So I did, I sort of, in undergrad, I studied math, but took on more and more writing and especially science writing stuff. And then uh, sort of went straight to grad school for it. So not a very interesting story, but a very efficient one anyway. Um, but yeah, you know, I the journalism part kind of just came because that was where I was, I ended up explaining, like I wanted to explain science and journalism turned out to be an incredibly impactful way to do that. Well, let's talk to your professor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, our first guest is the person who brought me to science journalism. And the story is somewhat well known. I, I was a political journalist who lost my job and happened to be at a party. And online, standing behind me, was Corey Dean. And she said, Claudia, I love your interviews. Why don't you do them about science? And I, being out of work, said, oh, I can do that. I did a book about the politics of women's health, but actually it was more about politics than it was about health or science. And I had had the, I had failed geometry four times in, in high school, the New York State record. And I figured I could do this just so long as I only got biology, but, um, <laughs> that I liked nature, and as long as the story had a narrative, I'd be able to do it. And so the next thing I knew, I was a science journalist and being assigned to interview nothing but physicists. <laughs> <laughs> One after another, I didn't even know how many physicists and how many declensions of physicists there were, 
but I would soon learn. And I think what Corey understood was that, um, that I would, by virtue of the fact that I didn't know that much detailed science, I would have to teach it to myself and that I would have the same questions that readers had. So uh, I wasn't too experienced in the field and I was open. And the wonderful thing was to join Science Times at a moment when some of the greats in science journalism happened to be working under her tutelage. Uh, so you could ask the most brilliant people for help and there was no shame in it um, I, that they did help you. And, uh, but, so, uh, there, there was a, there used to be an ad that went, I got my job through the New York Times. This, this is absolutely true. I got my job through Corey Dean and, and certainly got a new profession. Corey, uh, in addition to being the editor of Science Times at a glory moment, uh, is the author of three books, including this one. Making Sense of Science, which is published by Harvard University Press and is an attempt to get people to understand how they can communicate science better. What pushed you to write this book? Ah, well, can I, can I stop and say one thing? Please. The only, the only person in this room who got her job as a science journalist for a stranger set of circumstances than Claudia is me. <laughs> and I had been hired. It's a long, how it happened to be that I was hired by the Times as a copy editor on the national desk. It takes about a day to tell and it involves Barcelona chairs and all kinds of things that have nothing to do with us. However, I was hired as a copy editor on the national desk. I had never been a copy editor ever in my life. I didn't know anything about it. People used to scream at me. Mistakes, I'm not, I'm not, that is not an exaggeration, the mistakes I was making. It turned out that there was going to be a temporary three-month opening for an editor at a somewhat higher level in the food chain in the science department. And the science department called down to National and said, we need this excellent person. Oh no, that person's too valuable. We can't spare that. Well, what about this person? No, no, she cannot be spared. Well, what about this person? No, no, no. They went through the whole thing, and finally they got to me. Just as, so I owe this, I owe Scientific American everything. <laughs> Just as I was seen walking across the newsroom carrying a copy of Scientific American. <laughs> and my then boss turned to me with this look of infinite disgust and said, I didn't know you were interested in science. And I was, you know, okay, fine, modestly, not enough, not enough to subscribe to it. You could get it for free in your mailbox at the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, so uh, that was how I was transferred into the science department of the New York Times, and I fell in love with it immediately and basically never left. And the thing I loved about Claudia when I, so then I was offered the job of science editor of the Times, which is really, uh, I say this with a completely straight face, especially at the time that I had it, is the best job that has ever existed in the history of the known universe. It was absolutely fabulous. We had, it's fun, we had fun, we worked really, really hard, but we had fun. Anyway, um, one of the, my goals when I took over the job was to hear, to give the readers a chance to hear the voices of scientists in their own words with less mediation from a lot of editing and assigning and something and bumping and everything else. And I, Claudia's columns were running in the magazine. I thought they were fabulous. I, pro, you know, probably because I always read them, and look, when I saw one, I read it, no matter who the person was. They were always good. So I, that was why I, when I found myself talk, I had never met you, I don't think. No. I, and I found I was talking to Claudia, and I thought, this is my chance, you know, so would you be interested in doing this for us? Because that was exactly the kind of thing I wanted us to be doing. And I think that's a, kind of a non-trivial point because uh, scientists are, as a group, I mean, you're taught making these vast generalities, which is always a horrible mistake, but I think it's fair to say that as a group, they're not particularly interested in talking to a lay person in depth about their work 
and they he absorbed the culture of the lab, which is this is not the done thing. You don't you don't do this. But Claudia managed to draw out these people she was writing about, and she's done the same thing with the um, we use we call we call the uh, the uh, genre conversations about science, and I. Th I thought they were absolutely wonderful and I smashed it. And I'm, um, I'm sorry we don't see more of them today, actually, because I think the issue of finding a way for ordinary people to hear the voices of the scientists is, if anything, more important than, than ever. But well, the, that's very kind. And um, the best oh, years of my professional life were at Science Times, and I always look forward to the Su Tuesday Science Times meeting because you heard these brilliant people talk about their work and you learned stuff. It was like going to college all over again. Um, at any rate, uh, why get sentimental about the past? We have work to do now. Um, and uh, well, we now have a climate school here. Like Columbia, an entire school that gives degrees in climate. So there are a lot of people here who are really interested in what you have to say. So we should really perhaps throw the ball to uh, Eric Rostin, who's Bloomberg star climate reporter and was the editor of, uh, are you still? Uh, it's, I've been writing mostly the last few years. Uh, uh -huh. We have, uh, like 10 minutes before the pandemic started, we, uh, we launched uh, Bloomberg Green, which is a global uh, news organization within the news organization um, covering everything um, that, uh, uh, you know, just soup to nuts. And I, uh, so you're, you, I should address like how the pandemic you, changed. Or do you have a hard time getting people to pay attention to climate stories? I'm glad you asked. Yes. Um, <laughs> like for the last two months, I've been trying to figure out like um, how to approach the fact that um, for our regular readers, what I'm about to say is the most obvious thing that like you wouldn't even bring it up and we obviously wouldn't even write a story about it, but nobody else knows that coal is more expensive than renewable power pretty much all over the world. And uh, that, from that fact, the entire climate conversation gets flipped on its head. And like, we have all the solutions. We now have some money, you know, to, to deal with climate change. And all we have to do is the work. Like, that's the message of climate change now. All we have to do is the work. And, um, and it's it's over the last couple of years as this is has um, gained steam. It's you know it's changed the way a lot of people um, have thought about climate change. But like we know, like we know what all the headlines are. Like shut your eyes and you can see them, and they're no longer projections; they're data. Um, but uh, but like the amount of money and momentum and people that are going into doing the work is like to me that's the main story now. It's like what we're spending a lot of our time on. Um, and uh, that's uh, where my thoughts are at the moment. So like, there's a lot of appetite for it. Um, and we, we try to feed the appetite. Um, and you know, it's a matter of like, you know, uh, most people's relationship to climate change is like my relationship to like, you know, uh, I don't know, like Albanian, not to pick on the Albanians, like healthcare policy. Like I have no idea, you know, like people do their work and they drive their kids to soccer. And, um, and that's the world we all have to communicate in. Um, and it's not easy, but, um, but the appetite is growing because the need is growing. Let's go to the end of our table and because last, but not, last time we did this, John Timmer was the last person we called on and I can't do that, Jim, twice. <laughs> um, so uh, John Timmer, who is a senior editor at Ars Technica, which is published by Condé Nast, uh, did the thing that so many people in academe dream of doing. He left a research career to being a, for a career in journalism. What made you do such a dramatic thing? I wasn't very good at science. 
<laughs> well, that's a good reason. No, I, um, I ended up in a non-tenure track position where I was constantly scrambling for money in lab space, and it just, it wasn't how I wanted to spend the next 40 years of my life. And so I spent a year trying about five or six different potential careers as a freelancer, and here I am. I, and you have a job with health insurance now. Yes, it's, yeah, it's well, amazing. And, it, and they pay me even when I go on vacation. And, wow. And freelance. We, we all wish for such situations. Um, um, I would like to introduce somebody who is covering, with all her being, the, one of the most important science and social science issues of our time, reproductive health. This is... Gina Mahone, who happens also to be my editor at The Nation and has edited some of my interviews. Um, Regina not only has covered reproductive health, she has a book coming out from Amistad Press uh, coming shortly on how to explain abortion issues to uh, in a world where these issues have become propagandized and are unreal. Um, Regina, how did you, how did reproductive rights become your issue? Oh, interesting. Um, it goes back to, um, well, I was working at the Foundation Center. They had a News Digest, um, and I was a staff writer there and, um, just going to a lot of events, um, because I knew I didn't want to write News Digest for the rest of my life. Um, but I had an opportunity to interview a lot of philanthropists who were doing some impactful work in other countries um, around contraception and things like that. But I was just really interested in what was happening here. Um, and so when a position opened up at what was called RH Reality Check, um, I, as an assistant editor, I realized I liked editing a whole lot more than writing. Um, you can have, you know, dozens of ideas and <laughs> people who are interested in following through on all those ideas and even more interesting ways than you could imagine um, can turn those things around. And so I just, um, like, I, I just knew that was the thing I wanted to focus on. Um, but it, it's interesting because um, when the pandemic started, I was actually on maternity leave. Um, I had my son on January 1st, 2020. Um, and when I returned to work, um, I think it was April or May, um, it was around the time that the anti-abortion movement had really started to weaponize the, the pandemic to, to ban abortion. Um, and, you know, to say that abortion is an, an essential health care when your body is literally a t on a timeline, it's a very, you know, strict timeline for when you can do certain things in a lot of states. Um, but, you know, this idea that, well, abortion providers are taking masks away from essential health care workers in hospitals, so therefore they shouldn't be providing abortions and things like that. Um, and so to answer the question that you had asked around the table around what changed, for me it was really just like, telling the simplest stories were the most impactful, just reminding people what was actually real and true um, about these issues um, versus what um, you know people who didn't agree with reproductive health care were saying was true. Um, and really just making it very clear with people highlighting, you know, always highlighting people who are affected by these issues um, in, in real ways, in real time. Um, there was even a story, I can't remember where it was, but I think it's going to go into a book about um, a woman who had traveled by, by airplane from where she lived because she couldn't get an abortion to California to get an abortion. And she agreed to be, you know, photographed and, and all those things. And I, I really think those are some of the most impactful stories. And so I think... I don't know that the work that I do um, has changed so significantly. I think it just kind of like brought me back to the fundamentals of journalism in a lot of ways. Um, and that's a lot of what I do now at The Nation. Well, reproductive health care, particularly abortion, is one of these science issues that just impacts everyone and where there has been, let's say, more false narratives from the beginning than in other areas. I mean, uh, I remember once interviewing the head of the National Cancer Institute who had posted on his website a long thing about abortion causing cancer, um, when in fact what it was was a study that they had done on nuns who had never given birth and thus had higher cancer rates. That kind of misinformation 
was a regular feature of this issue. Um, you've always had to battle lies. How do you do that? Sure, um, that's a great question. I think um, one of the best things about working for RHLA Check Now, it's called Rewire News Group, um, was approaching reproductive health, rights, and justice as um, healthcare. Um, so not looking at it, I don't agree when people call it a debate, um, you know, just really looking at it as a form of healthcare, which it is, and talking about it that way. So that what I'm saying, and also moving away from this, and NPR does this a lot, moving away from this idea that we need to elevate the voices that are on the right, who are saying things that are fundamentally untrue um, as legitimate opinions without even qualifying that those things aren't legitimate. Abortion doesn't cause cancer. You know, the list of they don't cause hurricanes, as one politician said, <laughs> uh, and all these things. Like, just don't like you know, focusing more on the stories that anyone who may either need an abortion or love someone who needs an abortion and therefore is interested in learning more information about it, or someone who's just interested in in the the issue um, coming from a healthcare perspective. I think is the most important way to cover the issue. So our last speaker is uh, an alumnus of SEPA. Uh, Michael Rostin is a senior editor at Science Times, our alma mater. And um, he probably has, is maybe the only person in the universe who has a story to tell about how a boring econ lecture led him to being a journalist and a science journalist. Tell us this legendary story, Michael. I, I, I don't know if it's legendary. Um, you know, it, it's, it certainly might be a sign of, uh, you know, my, my work ethic for taking uh, lecture notes. So I, I want to thank all of you who are taking notes uh, very, very, very carefully of, of everything that we, we say up here, and we'll refer back to them. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, Claud Claudia likes this story. Um, you know, which is that I was I was sitting in these economics lectures. I, I had I had had to take economics before I, I went to grad school, and so I sort of felt like I didn't have that much more to learn here. Um, you know, obviously there was you know problem sets and homework to do and so on. But I had to sit in these lectures, and I started a blog. Uh, and uh, in in the process of starting the blog, uh, I uh, sort of worked my way into the inbox of uh, quite a few journalists who were uh, um, embracing uh, the format of blogging uh, in a serious way. That We're talking, you know, 2004, 2005, around that time frame when this was becoming sort of the, the new format that a lot of people were using to, uh, you know, distribute information f f uh, through the world, sort of po post-print, pre-social um, pre media. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another. And, uh, you know, 13 years later, I've, I've, I'm, 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 I'm working at the New York Times uh, in our science department, which was a strange series of events uh, that, that I didn't really expect to occur. Um, but I'm having a great time with it. Um, I think that, you know, if you ask the question, why are we here um, this in this beautiful world? I think one of the reasons that we're here is to tell stories. Um, and, uh, you know, I have found um, nothing more satisfying so far, so far in my career than the opportunity to tell all manner of stories and all manner of forms, uh, particularly focused on, uh, you know, science and medicine. I think there's just something about, you know, seeing, seeing this element of the world and the creative spirit of a lot of the researchers uh, and the innovative ways of thinking that they bring to things that's just really made me feel a lot better about the work that I do as a journalist than I think I felt uh, before I was doing it when I was working in breaking news and politics and other things. Um, you know, I think a big part of that, you know, sort of had to do with, with COVID. It was sort of an interesting moment in time, you know, because if you just think about this from a print perspective, um, you know, suddenly science was in the New York Times every day. It was all over the New York Times every single day. And every Tuesday, we still had to produce this print publication called Science Times. And if it had just been another six to 10 pages of COVID news, I don't think people would have really appreciated it too much. Because the truth was, those things were being covered um, you know, in great uh, you know, 
you know, extremely high quality quantity um, in, in the daily pages of the paper. And so we had to find a way to sort of continue to shed light on a lot of the other stories that were still ongoing, um, you know, whether it was, you know, amazing developments in research on sickle cell disease, whether it was the return to human space flight from the United States of America. Um, all of these things were still happening during COVID. And it was just really important to find ways to continue telling those stories. Um, and I'm, I'm glad we did. I think it was a, it was a good strategic decision that we made that um, you know, kept uh, you know, the, the science section of, of, of uh, you know, the print paper of the New York Times, but also our digital presence lively and animated and something that was uh, useful to a lot of our readers, um, you know, giving them some inspiration and some sense of awe and some wonder about uh, the universe around them. You know, at the same time, I didn't work that much directly on the COVID coverage. I mean, obviously there were parts of it that I had to do, but compared to some of my colleagues who really had to, you know, lift a lot of boulders uphill, um, I what I found was that, um, you know, our our paper really sort of shifted gears towards fully understanding that we had to provide a service to readers, and you know, I I, I continue to just be really grateful that I was surrounded by so many people who were, you know, producing the factual information, our COVID case counters, things like that, that ultimately provided so much information to so many people. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, I think that, you know, that that was such a valuable service that we have been providing for years, um, you know, since since the pandemic really got underway. And, um, you know, I think that that was just a really inspiring thing to see and, you know, play a, a very small role, very, you know, Teeny, 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 tiny role in, in, in being a part of. And that's why I'm glad I'm still working as a science editor at the New York Times. Well, let me ask you, panel, a question that we could do a lightning round like on Jeopardy with. Um, the, the thing that I think maybe a lot of people who came here tonight want to know is what advice do you have for the students on how they can have voices and have their science coverage heard. Um, based on your experience, can you offer one good nugget, one good piece of advice to get people started? Corey, you teach at Brown. You teach science journalism at Brown. Uh, what, do you, what do you tell your students? Well, if you're hoping to get a full-time job in which you're paid a living wage, uh, that's not as easy as it once was, and it never was particularly easy. Um, but the, what you have to do is have an idea of where you would like to see your work published, and I mean that in the broadest sense, broadcast, online, in whatever format. Where, where, would, you, where would you like to see your work appear? And are you reading those places? You have, to, you have to be reading or listening to or paying attention in whatever way is necessary to the arenas in which this kind of material is being published. And you have to study them. What are they doing that they seem to like? And is there something that they seem to like that you think is important that you would like to do? And what are they not doing that you think given the way they are, they ought to be doing. It surprises you that they're not doing. And think about how would you present, uh, or pitch, I guess, uh, how would you make a proposal to them to say, I see that you're doing a lot of this and this and this, you have neglected to cover that. It fits right into your pet, whatever, I have an idea. But you can't, you have to read obsessively, you have to listen obsessively, um, and you have to write obsessively. And that's, you know, you all know that already. Um, so that's not particularly helpful. But especially at the beginning, you, when you're going to editors and you're hoping that they're going to commission you to do something, you have to present yourself as someone who is going to solve a problem that they have. Maybe they don't even know what the problem is, but you've seen it because they should have been doing this and they haven't been doing it, but you can do it. But you have to be the person who can solve their problem for them. It's not, 
and you have to be able to demonstrate, that, you know, well, it's, I should shut up, but um, <laughs> well, it's good advice. Well, um, you know, they have to know that taking you on is going to uh, lessen their burden rather than increase it. You're not going to be one of these people who makes life miserable to them because you actually don't do a good job with your research, or you don't go far enough, or you, you know, you get your back up when someone suggests an editing change or any of that kind of stuff. But really, you have to, you have to know who, who, who is it you want to appeal to as a writer? What do they do? What do they need to do that they're not doing? And how can you help fill the gaps that you can see they have? Several of you are commissioning editors, meaning that you buy stuff from from journal, freelance journalism. What, when a freelance journalist approaches you, is a turnoff? That any indication that they haven't read us and have no <laughs> idea what sort of things we publish. Yeah. John, yeah, I think. Um, I would say is in, in, in broadly speaking, I mean, I am all for people, you know, coming out finding ways of, of you know, using the opportunities of science journalism as means of being able to express themselves and being able to find things that they connect with and that they want to be able to share that sort of passion with people. I'm all for that. What is frustrating for me as an editor, and I think that is the source of a lot of frustration for people who have problems with what you were asking in your previous question about, like trying to be able to, to reach an audience and get people to pay attention to you, is that you need to be able to rise up out of yourself in doing that. It, when you're looking for, for somebody to, to, to hire you to write a story, to publish a story that you want to pitch, you need to have a very clear idea of several things. First of all, you need to know what that story actually is. I, the, the number one thing that goes wrong with pitches that I see with the stories that I get is that writers think they know what the story is, and then they don't. They, they actually are writing something that's a little bit different where they're missing the thing that actually matters. And when I say what actually matters is that they are writing something that kind of delights them, but they are actually missing the point of why would someone want to read this? What is someone hoping to get back out of it? And why is a publication with a very specific audience, that, why is it that you think this is something that they would, would want to know about, that they would need to read? If you come to me as an editor and you make a pitch a story of here is something that your audience needs to read and you can make that case and you can convince me that you can tell that well, I of course will want to hire you for that sort of thing. So it goes back to, to John and Cornelia where we're both saying, we're both saying is right. You, you, you need to know what the publication is and you need to get a sense of what that audience is and you, you need to be able to, to focus on, on bringing that, that out in yourself. You need to be able to bring a discipline to what you're doing at the same time, you should be also work doing this kind of work out of a certain sense of love for it because that's the biggest reward you're going to get much of the time. I would add a flag. I wouldn't call it a turnoff, but a flag might be if someone has written one piece for a number of different publications because it suggests to me that they may have really strong ideas, but their actual execution might turn an, an editor off to assign more than one piece to them. Um, and so I think if you're, inter you know, I would suggest, you know, if you have a good experience working for a publication, trying to publish multiple pieces with them, because it does show, it, like it does create questions for us as editors when we're looking at what you've done and what you might be able to do. Um, because we as editors know often we do a lot of work, a lot of rewriting, especially for folks who are newer to journalism um, or newer to writing for a publication. And so um, we want to see that it's someone who can not just submit a great pitch, but also follow through on the work. And any further advice for newbies who want to get published? Now, our students do get published uh, very often. Uh, but the leap is to move beyond State of the Planet, which is our wonderful <coughs> website here and to get into off-campus publications. Um, yeah, well, I was going to, I guess you might be more advanced than this advice then, which is just to, especially at first, write everywhere you can find, especially where you can be edited, whether that's like your lab's blog or a class publication or anything. Like, eventually you are going to be wanting to get targeted clips and like, high-profile 
you know, magazines or whatever, but at first you just want to be showing off your work as good as possible. I'm talking as someone who just finally finished reading through 144 applications for a summer internship. <laughs> I really rely on clips, and I don't care as much where they're from if they're really good and they're telling a great story. And the more places, especially when you're, while you're a student, you can find to do that, uh, the better. Once you're actually a freelancer, you need to get paid for the, that calculus changes, obviously. One, one thing I'd suggest is once you've identified a place you want to work for, figure, figure out who the commission editor is there and ask them, can we do a phone call? I'd like to pitch you guys and I don't want to waste your time. And you know, one, you will raise your name recognition when the pitch is actually ready. And two, hopefully they'll tell you how to avoid some mistakes that other people have done when pitching them. Oh, and don't address your pitch to dear sirs. I actually get that a lot directly to me. <laughs> John, um, your advice is good advice, and it was probably good advice five years ago. What do you advise people um, to do in a world where people don't answer the phone? Um, email and Zoom. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the pandemic thing. Yeah, there there are plenty of different ways to contact someone. Just, and you know, if at first you don't succeed, there may be a spam filter standing in your way if you like sent them a bunch of links to your clips. Um, the, the real challenge is to figure out when you verge over into harassment. Uh, because, you know, I literally get somewhere between 30 and 50 PR emails a day, and so your, any email you send me is coming in with this massive flood of other stuff and I may not get to it for a week or something. So just, you know, you can try any means you feel is appropriate <clears throat> short of stalking them, but be aware that editors are extremely busy and it may take them a couple of weeks to get back to you. Could I, could I also just throw in that like, I think, I think there's a lot of like, um, you know, guidance on like, you know, how to, how to pitch publications that, that, that um, you know, very much centers on like, communicating with the publication. But I, I think what's also really, really, really important is uh, to sort of think of your career as kind of like a team sport. Um, you're, you're not just, you, you shouldn't just be out there alone. You should be, uh, you know, out there in consultation with peers, um, you know, because if, you know, people sort of at a horizontal level, you know, have some success, some of their success might be relevant to you finding some success of your own. I, you know, I don't care. I, I don't know if everybody in this room wants to be a journalist. I don't know if everybody in this room wants to be a science communicator. I'm not, I'm not really sure, but I just think like in just about any profession that you might want to pursue, um, you know, sort of having a group of people that you consider peers and maybe don't even necessarily consider close friends, but just people whose, you know, work ethic, the things that they do that you admire and that, you know, you can sort of have a, you know, honest conversation with about things that you want to do can be really valuable. You know, the first time I ever got anything published in, uh, you know, a real, uh, you know, publication happened because, you know, I really admired this one writer and I wrote, wrote to him and I started asking him some questions and he, and, you know, he shared some information with me about like, well, I know this person is commissioning stories. Um, you know, this person's commissioning op-eds. So why don't you reach out to, to him because he might take some of your ideas and do something with them. And turned out he was right, you know? So that wasn't something that, you know, came to me through any of my professors. It wasn't something that came to me through, uh, you know, just, just sending cold emails to anyone. It, it, it was sort of that, you know, I sort of was working on like identifying this peer network and building it out. Um, you know, sometimes the social scientists like to call this weak ties, you know, that like some, that a lot of times those are really powerful ways of, you know, moving yourself forward in whatever kind of work that you want to do. Well, let's throw this out to, to the floor. In the first row are students in the class, and you get first dibs on asking questions. Um, questions. Come on, class. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Grace Burns in Claudia's class. I'm in the Sustainability Management Program. Um, I would just ask about um, how you guys, I mean, it's open to anyone about the um, issue of like objectivity and remaining impartial in journalism, especially maybe when you feel so passionate about something like climate change um, and how you guys handle something like that. Did everyone hear the question? Okay. 
Yeah. I, Eric. I think I'm just passionate about fact checking. And, um, and that goes a long way because uh, I just, um, you know, you're just trying to figure out what's reliable. And um, that sort of will keep you honest to an extent. Um, you know, the opposite problem is, is you know, not being passionate, but being um, what's the um, opposite of that would be contentious, I guess. <laughs> you know, it's like I, you know, I, I, I find myself more often checking, uh, uh, just like just being unduly skeptical about something, but then it checks out and it's, it's fine. Um, it's a quick answer. Um, yeah. Do you, do you hate being wrong? If so, imagine being wrong in front of fifty thousand people. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very motivating. <laughs> there, um, you know, I don't know. Just, like, I've been doing this a long time, and like the terror of hitting the button never goes away. <laughs> like, every story, you know, there's a long tail to the anxiety of hitting the button. You know, it, like, there's a 24 hour arc where, you know, your career could end at any second. Um, and then, you know, two weeks later, you're probably out of the woods and by then you've done three other things. And, you know, you have all these balls of anxiety constantly up in the air about, oh my God, what if I got their age wrong or what if they're going to sue me? Or, um, anyway, I, uh, in sum, fact checking. Corey. Um, oh, okay. So, um, I agree with all of us, obviously. What you have to be is factually correct. But um, what I think of as the problem of objectivity is one of the most intractable problems in journalism generally and particularly in science journalism. And I don't know a good uh, cure for it. It's just something you have to think about all the time. But I can tell you from my own experience, um, I, most vividly when I wrote my first book, which was about beach erosion and coastal land use. And given the amount of money at stake and all of the political argle bargle and so on, it was a highly, highly contentious issue. And I knew that I wanted to say a lot of things in my book that some substantial portion of people interested in the subject were not going to like. And my goal in writing it was to make it impossible for any even faintly fair-minded uh, reader to dismiss my work as a polemic. I didn't want to embrace any idea that I thought was wrong, but I, did, I, wanted, to, I wanted the book to be impossible to dismiss as just one person's arm-waving account of whatever it is. And you, you, I mean, I'm not saying you necessarily want everybody in the world to buy your book or buy your story or whatever it is, but you, you want it to be unassailable on that ground. And so you have to take what people you think are wrong, are, you, have to, you have to be aware of what they're saying. You have to be aware of what is, insofar as there's any logic to their position, what is it? And, um, and if you do, that, I think that's helpful. The, the book that I'm talking about that I wrote was published in 1999 and it is still in print which in the world of books is uh, unusual, put it that way, if you're not, unless you're writing a cookbook or something. But, um, but so that I think is very important. The other thing is, um, and we talk about this all the time, that we put in caveats. We say, so-and-so says such and such a thing. Uh, most researchers believe the opposite. You know, some formulation along those lines. I don't believe that has any effect. And this is why, I, this is my opinion, but, but that's my belief. This is why I think the problem is so intractable. Because the problem is if you quote somebody or you describe the work of someone in your piece on the grounds of wanting to paint a large picture of the landscape for your readers or your listeners or whoever, the mere fact that you have mentioned these ideas gives them weight that no amount of caveating is going to sweep away. And when I say that I think the problem of objectivity is intractable, that is what I'm talking about. And I do not know what a good remedy for that is. And I have over the years talk, spoken many, many, many times to groups of researchers and they will say, well, why don't you just tell the truth? Tell the truth as you know it. 
And I, you, this was before Fox News became the <laughs> pinnacle of journalism. And I would say to them, be careful what you wish for, because you're going to get people who are just, you know, the idea of trying to assess from a distance what exactly is going on is going to go away. And I would say that's what, we, with Fox News on one end and MSNBC or whoever you want to cite, you can pick your people on either. I think that's what we have today. And I think it is debasing our national conversation on all kinds of issues, particularly issues that pertain to science. But as I say, I have you people, please find a solution to this because it's um, damaging. Are there other questions from? Ah, we're, we're going to, Michelle, we're going to call on people in the class first. I'm Michaela, that's a good name. Uh, and I'm a student in uh, Claudia's class, Masters of Science and Sustainability. And this is for um, this is for everybody. And it's about, you mentioned audience engagement and because you have such specific audiences, how do you maintain accessibility in your writing, but then still maintain a level of like technical relevance? Well, I, I think, I think you know, that, that really is sort of the fundamental question you're sometimes trying to answer is like, who is this story for? And you really do have to sort of start out sometimes asking asking that question. You know, um, you know, I got I got a you know, uh, you know, I had this I had this uh, colleague who who, who retired. I, I miss her a lot every day. But um, I sent her a study that I saw one time that was about some significant scientific development in a study that involved mice. And you know, I said to her, "Is this a big deal?" And she said, yeah, it's a big deal if you're a mouse. Um, and I, I, think, I think that that you know, sort of highlights that like, you know, sometimes there are things that can seem like it's really significant in a laboratory setting. It could be really significant to other scientists. Um, you know, is that actually going to be significant to the broader audience uh, of the publication that I work for? The answer was probably not. So we didn't do the story. And you know, I, don't, I don't regret that. Um, so I, I think, you know, you really do have to start out with that question. And then you also have to sort of be careful about some of the shorthands that get employed in certain kinds of, um, you know, technical literature where they sort of sound simple, but they're, they're, they're actually, um, you know, a lot less simple than, than they appear to be. I think this comes up a lot in writing about, you know, genetics, for instance, where they've just developed all these shorthands to develop, to describe, you know, very complicated things because they don't want to have to say them every time. And, but, you know, if you ask a, a reader, you know, what does this mean? They have no idea because it's just sort of this jargony term that sounds simpler than it actually is. So those are, those are things that I'm frequently looking out for uh, when things get filed to me, because especially in a lot of cases, a lot of my writers are so fluent at having conversations with um, you know the researchers and are able to have these very sophisticated questions with them, uh, questions and, and discussions with them that they will sort of miss the fact that they've started to talk like them. Uh, John Rennie, you, you're shaking your head. Uh, oh yeah, no, I mean I would, I would completely agree that that is. I mean that's kind of the the central problem of all of, of you know science technical communication in a lot of ways. And, and, and Michael's exactly right. There is not a fixed set of answers. I think that you as a writer and as an editor and as an institution are constantly examining that. But I think also what you, what, again, it's part of the process of the writing and the editing that always goes on is you really need to, in the same way that you start off looking at why are we doing the story, what do I want, what is this story really about, part of what you are looking to get into is what are you hoping someone's supposed to take away from this? Because that's, that's what you focus on, and that's what you try to make sure that that's going to be clear. Because once you have a sense of that, you can immediately start to figure out how much else you're going to drop. One of the things that is, is endlessly frustrating for a lot of writers of what happens with, with editing is, is that writers will sometimes submit to me manuscripts in which they have, in wonderful, painstaking detail, described how different kinds of work were done. And I quickly take that right back out because of the, those sort of procedural things, I, in theory, I would love to be able to include them too, but they almost always involve adding on a lot of exactly the kind of detail that needs to be explained, and at the end of the day, it may not really affect the important thing I want them to have. So it's easier to take that out. 
the more, the more the extraneous information you can pare away, the easier it is to see the things you want revealed. So, did I see a question back there? Uh, yes. You are. student from, um, from SIPA. Uh, myself is a, a, a formal environment journalist. Um, and my question is to all. So, so I, um, I guess like one of the, the saying in science reporting is that um, the science stories need to be accessible to like all audiences, regardless the um, you know, political beliefs. Um, but at the same time, we know like in all contexts, there's also like a, there's always like a political or policy regime that's governing what science research is important, what is less important. So I wonder like um, in your reporting, how do you, what, to what extent uh, does that political policy reality need to be explained? And then, um, in, like, if you have any example um, in the case where you have to balance between, so say, the uh, interests of science and interests of politics kind of conflict with each other, how do you balance your narrative? That was the entire pandemic. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, as, as John Timmer says, that's, that was particularly an issue during the pandemic. I, I, I wish, Corey, if you could tell about some of the, the borderlines at the Times that you encountered to make sure that Science Times was not influenced by these other considerations. And perhaps you can add to that too, Sarah. Can I just say one comment on the question of, uh, please, yeah, of um, please reaching your readers? And, and then, um, but <clears throat> when you're writing, your, your, your ideal audience should be like this, right in front of your face. What a lot of people do, I think, and, and I include me, uh, without realizing it, you're writing for your sources. That is a lethal mistake. Do not do that. And you, what you care about is whether you're, I say readers, because I write for a newspaper, but whatever, your listeners, whoever they are, you, what you, they are the ones you care about. And you, they, need to be, they need to be right in front of your face. And every word you put down on your page, do they understand it? And there are a lot of tricks to do. I actually wrote another book called Am I Making Myself Clear About <laughs> Science Communication? And, um, uh, there are a lot of little tricks of the trade to, that you can do that are actually helpful, I think. Um, but the main thing is, you're, don't write for your sources, write for your, for your audience. Um, and so, with the question of politics, is that what you're... Yeah, I, in the question of objectivity, uh, there, were, there were, as I recall, very strong barriers or guardrails against being yeah. impacted by the, the, the um, subject that I got into the most for that as a writer was the coverage of the arguments about the teaching of evolution. And that was highly politicized, obviously. And um, what I started doing was I crafted, you know, I was like, okay, how can we say, you can't say that anything in science is true. All you can say is this idea has been tested and has held up. Because th the thing that differentiates a science idea from a religious idea or some other kind of idea is that it's, it's capable of being tested. And it's capable of failing the test, which has happened with ideas that everybody knew were true and it turned out they were false. But anyway, I, so I crafted this language, which the creationist community actually, they went on, they had a whole website about how this was Cornelius Creed and, mm -hmm. you know, they wrote me nasty letters about what a godless person I must be, et cetera. But anyway, what I said was, there is no credible scientific challenge to the theory of evolution as an explanation for the complexity and something else, I forget the word, of life on Earth. And all of that is true. I didn't say it was true. I just said it has yet to be credibly challenged. And what sometimes you need to do is craft. How do you craft? It took me a while to figure that out. But you have to craft something that you can say with confidence is, this is the truth. And that, was, that statement is, in my opinion, unassailable. Um, but then you have to not be afraid to say it. 
Could I take issue with something there? Absolutely. To, we at Blotch Evolution take place. We've, we've seen it happen. And so to the extent that you consider something like that true, it is true. Yeah, you, I mean, I, that, I, that would say... That, Viruses, we've seen them evolve. Well, oh, we've seen you know, you know what I... Um, my example of this is um, Max Planck. This is m one of my favorite stories in science. You know who Max Planck was, the eminent physicist, Planck's constant, et cetera, et cetera. Max Planck was a young man around 1900 in Germany, and he decided he wanted to be a physicist. And he went to some mentor in his university or whatever it was and said, I'm going to study physics. And the mentor said, Max, physics is over. We know about the atom, we know about the neutron, we know about radiation, we know about x-rays, we know blah, 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 it's done, it's a dead end. And so he said, well, you know, I'm gonna do it anyway, I like it, so I'm gonna do it. So he became a physicist. And then here comes Einstein with his miracle year, five paper, you know, whatever, blah, 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 now physics is like, hmm. And then here comes Max Planck who finds the little loose end on Einstein's work and tugs it out of the crocheted afghan until the <laughs> whole thing falls apart. And we have still not figured that out. So I would say, what I, when I talk about, I talk to people, should I say this? And what one person said is, you could say that there are some ideas that have been so abundantly established that people no longer think it's, a, a real particularly good target for research because we think, you know, but I would be very, well, I am also a great believer in covering my own ass. So <laughs> I would be, I would, I would be very cautious about putting you yourself behind any assertion that anything in science is true. It was a known scientific fact that people got ulcers for living a stressful life and eating too much spicy food. Until it was discovered that you got an ulcer because you had a helicobacter pylori infection in your stomach. And when the people who had that idea put it out, they were, the entire world, they were from Australia, the entire they were world. From a remote part of Australia. Yes. They were from Perth. And they were just absolutely ridiculed until they went to uh, what, Stockholm and uh, accepted the nice medal from the King of Sweden, and you know, there you go. <laughs> and you know, uh, you, can, you, can you can name any number. So I'm, but it's cowardice, uh, basically, that makes me do that. But I was confident. I could say with this theory of evolution, there's no credible challenge to it. There may one, one day there may be one, but there isn't one yet. But, but anyway, what I'm getting at is figure out what you can say with confidence, and you can put your own name behind with confidence, and, and that will help you. I think that helps you be clearer with your readers, but lots of times people hate you for it. A lot of Eric wants to jump in. Who thinks the Earth will warm more than 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial temperatures? Why do you get to decide? I'm, like, I'm serious, this is a debate I had with, with colleagues a couple months ago. Like, it's, it's not your job to decide. Like, the scientists don't decide. You know, they say, well, you know, among the 88 most aggressive emissions-cutting scenarios, nine of them were able to achieve 1.5 degrees or less of warming. Um, so that's among, you know, they have, like, whatever, a thousand scenarios. A hundred of them, say, are the most aggressive 1.5 uh, degree we can achieve at scenarios, nine of those say we can hit it. They didn't have a report saying we're going to miss 1.5 degrees. The one they came out with last week said in the near term we may hit it. Um, so it's not the scientist's job, therefore it's not my job to say we're going to miss 1.5 degrees. The politicians are certainly not going to get up and say, um, well, we're definitely not going to hit 1.5 degrees. So no one is saying we're going to hit 1.5 degrees and everyone in the room knows we're gonna miss 1.5 <laughs> degrees. So like, how do you write about that? <laughs> and the way you write about it, maybe it's just the professional conventions that you know, we're trained on is like, we can't say it. Like I can't write, because I cannot demonstrate that we're gonna pass 1.5 degrees. Um, so like, that's an example of a very uh, contentious debate right now that is absolutely so commonsensical, it's not even worth bringing up, 
and yet nobody can say it with any justification. Climate is a really good example of this. I, um, there was a man named uh, Stephen Schneider who was at Stanford. Absolutely <laughs> fabulous climate science. And he gave a talk about how the conventions of science are that you can't say anything is statistically significant unless it has only a 5% chance of happening by, by uh, you know, randomly. And where did we get that figure? Somebody made that up. Mm -hmm. That's not, you know, ordained in the patterns of the stars. If someone said, oh, let's do 5%. Several fields have had to change their standards yeah, because it's they just, but, So what he said in his talk was, if I told you, it was when the convention of science was that there was a 70% chance that human activity was going to alter the whatever, blah, blah, blah. And so he said to his audience, if I told you, and the scientist said, well, it's only 70%. We haven't got to 95% yet. So he said, if I told you there was a 70% chance there was botulism in your sandwich, would you eat your sandwich? And so part of that is like, you know, when is it, when are the conventions of the research field not the same as the sensible, you know, whatever of real life? And that's a thing you can write about. If but, can, oh, I'm sorry. no, I'm sorry. I'm Steven Snyder wrote, he passed away several years ago, he wrote one of my favorite things on this topic. It's an essay called, I think, Meteorology, like M-E-D-I-A-rology. <laughs> and it's a juxtaposition of how lawyers do their thing and how scientists do their thing. And the lawyers only take one side and they go in and like, you know, go 100% uh, uh, down on that. And scientists say, well, previous workers have said this and this, and it's just, it's an entirely different, like epistemology of, um, of how you walk into a subject, whether you're giving credence to the people around you or you're not. Um, and we live in a culture, back to the question of like politics and science, we live in a culture that's dominated by this legal, I take a side and it's not my job to bring in context. Like the scientists, it's their job to bring in context. and so. Like this, it, I haven't looked it up in a few years. This essay, Meteorology, was on the internet, you know, in the past. I hope it's still there, but I would recommend that as a, a yeah. further uh, addendum to this uh, question. Well, now that we've solved the whole issue of objectivity <laughs> in science reporting, are there other questions from your audience? Uh, Kira Pikov, who was an early TA in an early rendition of this course, <laughs> more than a decade ago. Hi, everybody, and um, thank you so much to Claudia, who I had the privilege of TAing for a decade ago um, <clears throat> and worked in journalism for the last 10 years. And my question is about feature storytelling. <clears throat> How much do you have to balance the human side of it with the technical side of it? How important is that when you're talking about, let's say, like a new technology and development? Uh, boy, I, I, I think it really, it really depends on the story. You know, this is, this is really one of those things where there, there isn't a blanket issue. Um, you know, I think, I think John, for instance, was like talking about, you know, the, the whole, whole idea that like, you know, scientists can get sort of overly wrapped up in their methods and writers can get overly wrapped up in their methods. And, you know, then there's other cases where the methods turn out to be really much more interesting than the actual scientific findings. And so I think like, <laughs> You know, that's an example of, of a situation where, um, you know, the crazy ways that people do things um, can, can really sort of, you know, tell you a great story sometimes. You know, I think, I think one of my favorite, you know, stories that I ever assigned, I don't, I don't know if anybody actually read it, but, you know, um, you know, these researchers go down to Antarctica and they get on these little boats and they get these big poles and they get cameras and then they attach cameras to whales. And I just thought, wow, that's that's crazy. That's like a weird thing that scientists are doing, you know. And you know, frankly, I'm not really sure the scientific results from those methods have given us anything extremely useful. Maybe the maybe the oceanographers and the marine biologists might disagree, uh, you know, because that could be a problem for their ability to get their next grant. But I do think that, like, you know, the process of doing these things can 
can can really like lead to a great story sometimes and i think it can sort of tell you something about like how scientists come up with weird ways to do things and understand a problem and it doesn't necessarily always bear fruit but um you know it can be really helpful you know i think i think another thing that i often think about is like who's the main character in this story and so sometimes i'll say to my editor or like i said to my reporter i'll say like well can you turn the rocket into the main character you know because i think like that's that's like the thing that you have to do sometimes is think about like what's what's this thing you know who, who's this thing really about and that's that's a sort of a thought process that i'm going through sometimes when i'm dealing with more featurey stories i think again i'll bring it back to that point of what exactly are you looking to have someone get out of the story are you just adding the human element in there just because just to show that there are people who are actually also who also happen to be standing around the science probably not you probably are want to do that because there's something that was happening with those people that they were doing that was mattering to them that became part of it um it, it was an interesting thing of exactly this uh, a, a few months ago i worked with somebody on our, our staff a biology writer, Yasmin Sapopoglu, she wrote a, a big 10,000 word story that was about looking at the question of Alzheimer's disease and why it is that despite the fact that you will, and you will still see this every time you see an article about Alzheimer's disease, that people will routinely talk about the fact that the amyloid hypothesis of that's what's going wrong. It's Alzheimer's disease is caused by amyloid. This has been the idea that has been pushed since the, the very late 80s, early 90s. And yet it is an idea that has held up and has given us extremely little during this time. So we told the story that was about why, that, why has this idea held on when so many other areas of work have also been going on suggesting alternative root causes for Alzheimer's disease. Now there's one way to tell that that would involve just going through the massive data dump of the, of, of the science itself on that. But no one wants to read that because also that's the story of there are people who are actually pushing those things. There are people who are in that situation of saying, I've got a great idea for this and never getting funded. There were people in, who were on the side of this of pushing ahead, happily riding the tremendous things that were happening all the way through all of that. And then at the same time, we started to realize like, you know, we're telling us all the, from the story of the different sort of the researchers, what happens with the different patients who are actually involved with some of this? What happened to you know, the family that first made it possible to identify a genetic cause, which is responsible for that amyloid link? When you start to think those things through, people will start to present themselves. And I think at that point, the natural kind of human drama of that will at best serve as a vehicle for bringing the rest of the science and things along with you. The gentleman back there, identify yourself. Oh, hi. Well, I'm Hussein Mawson. I'm a postdoc in computational cancer genetics, but also a freelance writer on topics at the intersection of science and politics. And my question is particularly to Dr. Timmer, uh, because you said that you were a researcher. Uh, and Form formerly. Uh, yeah, so from experience, I think uh, the group that often has a high skeptical attitude towards science are scientists themselves because they know it's a different form of skepticism, but because you know the if and else scenarios and all of the limitations of the scientific method without abandoning it altogether. So how do you, as a former researcher and current editor, strike a balance between building a coherent story or editing a coherent story while also, quote unquote, covering the, your bases so that you know these if else scenarios, particularly when you're covering um, breakthroughs, which are by definition often standing on shaky grounds. Um, so there, there's a couple of things there. One, a lot of the decision making goes on before you start writing. So should you do this story? Um, one of the big things about the pandemic is all of a sudden, a lot of journalists were suddenly faced with this flood of preprints. And we're dealing with a situation where the consensus was still building. And some outlets chose to, we will, chose the route of, we will hop on any preprint that looks exciting. And others waited for an actual consensus to form. And I think the public was poorly served by the former. Um, and that was, yeah. There was the earlier question of, you know, what have you learned from reporting the pandemic? And I, 
I think learning to recognize a consensus in progress and when a critical point has been reached before reporting something was really incredibly an important lesson we came away with from that. Um, and then, you know, once once you have actually chosen to do a story, you know, I, I agree that all science is a tentative and uncertain, and there are ways of conveying that. And, and you know, you don't necessarily have to have a canned phrase expressing uncertainty, because the uncertainty is different in every subject area. But you should think about how best to convey uncertainty. Um, you know, some, some places always require you to talk to three sources before you know you actually run with the story and make sure they all, all agree or you know express their disagreement as part of the piece. There's lots of ways of building that into what you actually produce. Um, one, two. I can, I can just hey, I'm Samir, and this is Bill. I just wanted to ask if anyone here writes headlines or has thoughts of headlines. <laughs> <laughs> many, many thoughts. Both positive and negative. <laughs> Why do you ask about yeah. headlines? Okay, well, just to up what uh, John said, I think definitely during the pandemic, there were a lot of good stories that had a lot of contingency built into them, even into the lead, and the headlines maybe didn't, or suggested paraphrasings of them, knowing how stories flow through a social ecosystem that quickly distorted maybe what the claims were in the actual story. So even when precautions were taken, you know, you're one or two clicks away from getting to the real sentence that you wanted to read first up. Um, and I don't know exactly how, you know, I know there's a division, authors don't write their headlines, but editors do, but which editors do, and how does that work? There's, there's a weird problem with headlines, which is that a lot of the, a lot of the like headline writing conventions that exist um, sort of emerged out of a period of time where you had this much space and you had to like really sweat sometimes to figure out how to like fit the key idea into, uh, you know, that much space. And, you know, there are sort of, you know, the, the, the famous, you know, howlers of just like completely you know, um, incomprehensible headlines, like, you know, the famous one for, I think, the Financial Times, which was just worthwhile Canadian initiative. I mean, you, can, you can just see, like, you know, the, the, you know, the, the slot editor five minutes before the, the page has to go off to, you know, to, uh, to, to, to the print shop, you know, sort of, sort of, sort of thinking like, oh, fuck, I got to do something, right? And they, and they just put it in, right? And so it's like, I think we still sort of have the, these, like, habits sometimes that were formed out of that world uh, for those of us who have been around long enough. And, you know, the reality is that, like, we do have a lot more flexibility, um, but I think we also still have to think about the idea that, like, you know, we're writing for different audiences sometimes. You know, I think, like, when it comes to science in particular, I have this thing that, like, really bothers me, which is that I'll have scientists say, like, the title of the story is wrong. It's not a title, it's a headline. Mm -hmm. The title is the thing that's the title of your paper that you published in your academic journal, which is trying to reach a very particular audience. The second that you say to me that you're trying, I've written the wrong title, what it's telling me is you're thinking about what this would have said if you had written it for an academic journal. I'm not writing for an academic journal. I'm writing for a newspaper that has a digital website that also gets distributed over social media, also gets indexed by Google search, you know, and, and Bing search, and you know, pretty soon is just going to get summarized by you know uh, an artificial intelligence chatbot. These are all the things that are happening, you know, when we're writing headlines. At, at the same time, you should recognize that sometimes your headline is wrong, and be prepared to deal with that. Well, not mine. <laughs> let's get, let's get a few more people in. Um, gentleman there, um, and lady there, and lady there. Well, how are we fix for time? I don't have a watch on me. Oh, we've got a half hour still. Here. So, um, um, sir. Yeah, my name is Wilson, and I work on uh, complexity science and systems thinking for consultancy. Uh, I, I I came in a little bit after ask this question. Number one. Uh, Whenever I talk to individuals about uh, climate change and everything, uh, they don't understand the complexity of climate change. And how do you communicate that to 
regular people who don't understand feedback loops or tipping points. Do you use people from like behavioral economics, social psychology? When you tell an individual that climate or weather is gonna change by 1.5 degrees to two degrees by 2050, no one is paying attention. Because their terms of reference is what happened last week when temperature changed from 40 degrees to 60 degrees within a day. And how you communicate that, I think makes a lot of difference because in behavioral economics, they, they call it mental accounting, uh, framing effect, uh, confirmation bias, those kind of things are there. So how do you collaborate with people who do those kind of research, but it's not getting effective? That's, that's my question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's hard. Uh, I think you, we, we probably have, uh, I think we're set up to fail, right? Because when we talk about uh, one and a half or two degrees of warming, like the degree there basically had nothing to do with, like first of all, global average temperature isn't a thing, you know? Like it's a, it's a math problem. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we would probably be better off if, you know, we can't let it warm more than 1.5 units. You know, that would be like probably better uh, communication than having to deal with degrees. Um, so I, I think one is like for just like whatever our daily story is, we just kind of make the best of it. Um, I, I think, um, you know, when we, we'll, we'll talk about for global temperatures, we'll talk about degrees Celsius. For if it's a US story, you know, we'll, it, it's a local temperature, we'll talk about Fahrenheit. You know, so there's like little tiny like hacks um, to try to deliver the contextually appropriate information for the specific story. Um, and so just trying to like hack our way around this, this terrible communication problem we've identified. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, then sometimes we'll, uh, we've, and everybody does this, they're great. When, when you have time to, to like step back and do a really cool explainer project. Um, and you know, a, a lot of media organizations have, have had bandwidth over the years to produce some really helpful work that just kind of lives on their website forever uh, as, as an explainer. Um, and then you know, a lot of it is like the system stuff is just, it's just a supersized you know, like emblem of all of climate communication. It's like how do you write about tipping points if you can't use the word nonlinear, <laughs> right? You could say unpredictable, but that's not quite it, you know. There have been a couple of tipping points we passed, and there are scientific studies on that. And, it, you know, if you catch them, there is a great point where you can just say, here's the concept of the tipping point, here is how it played out in the real world. And, you know, and then whenever it comes up, you just link back to that original story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's an example of that in today's Washington Post that's worth looking at. They have a reporter who did uh, a history of the semi-automatic weapon that was used in the massacre in, in Nashville. I'm sure this piece has been in preparation for a while, and they were just waiting for the next massacre to run it. But it will sit there now for the next one and the next one. And we'll, we'll understand how this has gotten into the circulation of life in our country. Um, these kind of explainers do a lot and they are something new. They didn't really kind of exist in, in the journalism of 20 years ago where you kind of had these magazine length stories in newspapers. And they're really wonderful. When the Times does them, I'm, I'm, I'm always thrilled. Um, but this Washington Post piece, I suggest that everyone look at. Let's get I a... I just want to add a point, though. About, oh, please, I, Regina. I think that there are similarities between abortion and climate and how people, you know, I started at RHL check in 2013, and in 2013, we were talking about how Roe is going to be overturned. And it's like with climate, like people just see the stories and kind of move on with their day. Um, and I think one of the most important things that we have to do as people who actually are very passionate about these issues is to like not stop talking about them, not stop assigning them, not stop writing them, because more over time, more and more people will start to pay attention to them. And that's not to say like we just write whatever, like obviously we want to write compelling stories, stories that people want to 
read stories of, you know, featured the people who were affected and things like that. But, um, but it's just, it's really important to continue to create space and to, to do really good journalism around these issues that some people may or may not be paying as close attention to as they should, because it's, you know, Roe will be over, you know, like it was, and, and all these things will continue to happen. Let's hear from a few more of the students. Uh, this lady and then that lady, and uh, please identify yourself quick. And Thank you. Yes, I'm Jennifer Allen from the Climate School, and I felt like one of the most depressing things to come out of the pandemic was the demonization of Anthony Fauci. And uh, what many of his critics, you know, attacked him for was that his advice changed during the course of the pandemic. And I wondered how you guys dealt with that in the newsroom and that maybe it was time to remind people about the scientific method and why <laughs> advice changes over time. And you sort of take that as given. And was that a discussion and how did you address it? I'm glad you brought that up. Um, yeah. What do you do when, when, when good science involves change? And when that is weaponized against, against the scientist or the policy. Well, if I could rant a little bit, we should be <laughs> relying less on trusted personalities to convey advice because sometimes they wander off the reservation and into their own opinion. And that has been a major problem during the pandemic that people keep going back to these individuals who appear trustworthy, even after they clearly not represent a, a consensus view on things. So there's, there's my rant for the evening. You, you know, I, I guess, you know, um, there, there, there is a lot of political machinery out there in the world that's trying to deliver its own message about things. And um, you know, you have to understand that terrain that's going on as a reporter or an editor, uh, because if you don't, you know, you'll wander into traps. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's, that's an important thing for anybody who's, who's, a, who's a journalist, you know, dealing with science or any other topic really to do is, is understand that like, you know, one, one thing does not live apart from another thing. Uh, these things all live together and you have to understand the context in which they're operating. And if you don't, um, you know, you're going to have the kinds of problems that, uh, you know, uh, we've been discussing, you know, like when, when John brought up the, the, the problem of like preprints, for, for instance, the, you know, if you, just, if you just started writing about something just because it was out there without understanding the broader context in which it existed, you know, you might make a bigger deal out of something that didn't deserve to be um, a bigger deal. Um, and, you know, uh, you might make a smaller deal out of something that actually deserved more attention. Um, and so I think that that's been a really important, you know, lesson, um, you know, whether, uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, the demonization of certain public health figures or whether we're talking about, you know, other areas of coverage, you, you know, you have to understand where all these things are coming out of um, because you can continually report things, um, you know, just because they appear newsworthy, but there actually may be a reason that they appear newsworthy and you have to understand what that reason is. Let's try to get to everyone, um, please. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Isha. Uh, I'm at the Climate School as well. Of the Climate Yeah. Um, I was a journalist for over a decade before I came here for the uh, masters. Um, what you said spoke to me so much. I think my stress-induced uh, headaches have decreased since I've come here <laughs> because of that hitting the button. Send. Um, my question is regarding diversity in the newsroom. Um, Journalism in general in the US, and I think science journalism in particular is, is incredibly wide. Um, what does the diversity do to the coverage that you have, uh, especially for subjects like climate change or healthcare, which have deep <coughs> racial, colonial undertones to them? Uh, and also, what are the barriers to entry for people of color? Okay, one question. Um, what, what, how much diversity is there in your coverage? And well, how? on the staff side, we're uh, hiring, I think, is uh, and it has changed, uh, you know, dramatically uh, in the current generation. I, I mean, that's clear. Um, like climate change, fundamentally, is an inequality story. It's about how rich white nations got all the fossil fuels and used them and caused this problem, and uh, people in poor countries are suffering the worst consequences. 
And so inequality, it permeates every element from diplomacy to science to science itself. And like one thing, um, uh, you know, I've been working on the last few years is, um, uh, is inequality in the geosciences. There was, just a, there was another paper in the last two, um, two weeks or so uh, about, about that. You know, it's just, um, I, I think it's become in the last two to five years uh, much, much more apparent um, just how white and how male um, anything related to climate change is. Uh, the way I recommend, last thing, is um, uh, the website carbonbrief.org. Uh, last week ran a, um, a really you know, serious study of the first um, IPCC report that came out in uh, of this cycle. It came out in August 2021. And you know, like, I can't remember the percentage, but like, it's all you know, European and American scientists. So it's everywhere we look, and consequently, we're trying to write about it everywhere we look. More questions. We're, we're it's, it's great that, that we have so many. Uh, have you already asked a question? No, please. So my question is about uh, how do journalists act when uh, you have scientists and doctors now on social media and coming up with Twitter threads directly uh, telling so like, how do journalists and science reporters make a sense of that and communicate the right uh, Also, uh, my question was also related to COVID. When a reputed journal like Lancet publishes a story on ivermectin so and then retracts it. Uh, so your question is about the Dr. Oz factor. How, how do we deal with the fact that a lot of people who are called doctors and scientists can use the internet to promote their ideas. How do you deal with that? Well, I mean, you know, it's, you know, so social media is a source, and you always got to check your sources. I mean, it's it's really just that simple, right? I mean, like you can you can go and just publish a single source story, and you'll look like a fool, right? So it's like if 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 a prominent or you know not so prominent person is out there, uh, you know, delivering a message, you know, you got to report it out. So I think that's that's my answer is like. You know, thank, it's it's sort of like, thank you for the tip, doctor. Thank you for putting this out to the world. You know, I will now do my job as an editor or as a reporter to understand whether what you said has any validity. I mean, you can't just rely on social media all on its own. Um, you know, so it's 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 our jobs to figure out if any of these things are valid and if they're worth amplifying. So, in our closing few minutes, we'd like to get to everyone if we can. Uh, We'd like you to ask one brief question pointed to one of our speakers, and then we'll go on. So I saw some more questions. Gentleman in the back, uh, you are. Hi, I'm Liam Eddy. I'm an uh, undergrad student in GS. Um, I guess all of you are editors, so it's open. But um, how do you envision AI tools, writing tools like ChatGPT, all of these uh, new tools that are coming out? changing the field of journalism and writing in general. So should we worry about robots putting us out of business? <laughs> I mean, we, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, if, if you go to certain websites like Fizzorg and such, they're basically repackaging press releases from um, you know, universities and such as original stories. So we're already dealing with junk out there masquerading as journalism. I don't see the equation changing dramatically. I see the volume changing dramatically. OK. I think we're all saying we're not that worried about the robots. Well, we've, we've had automated stories for several years. Um, and so there's some stories that we'll just never write about again because the computer can scrape documents and put the numbers in the right place. Yeah. I, I think the interesting thing in terms of what might be an interesting transformation or transition that would happen within the profession is that right now we get off to talk about you've got people who are reporters and writers and editors. Uh, and it's possible that depending on the ways in which people are working, that humans 
maybe come, start to become more important for that, the reporting role of going off and being able to get different kinds of information, especially being able to weigh what information to bring in. And you might end up relying on some sort of AI that would be developing a certain kind of fast first draft that then everyone is also functioning as an editor to then try to clean up. So I think that's an interesting sort of thing of, of that we might start to find much more reliance on that. And you know, I mean, we'll see how well that works. Interesting. Question. Yes, you are. Um, my name is Gina, and I'm from the bioethics program. I want to ask all of you a question. question not all of them. One <laughs> person. Really? Otherwise, like it's not ethical. At this okay. moment. Um, but when you're reporting on like a controversial issue, and everyone just goes report on the same thing, do you try? Do you also go and report on the same thing, or are you trying to find a unique perspective? Or like when everyone tries to interview the same person, like do you also go find the same person to interview? Or how do you choose your sources? Like do you find a unique source? Like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think most of us, there's, that's, no one wants to be doing stories that are exactly photocopies of everybody, everybody else's stories, which is what would happen if you're just following the lines of least resistance of doing that. So I think we almost all reflexively are trying to find other people who have different points of view. You know, I think this is also where it comes back to some of the issues of diversity. Um, when in doubt, look for what kinds of voices, ones that particularly may be relevant to issues that are not getting featured in a lot of those kinds of stories. So yeah, we, we always try to do something special and of value. Um, how do you find your sources then? Yeah, so there, I mean, that, that can definitely be the, the, the tricky thing that comes from that. I mean, part of it is obviously the, the depth of people, you know, the, the, whether it's the reporters themselves or sometimes being the contacts they have of being able to ask other people that they know in the field, of, who else is good about this? Do you, you know, the question will get asked as nakedly is, do you know uh, a woman scientist who could be able to speak to this issue in some cases? You know, that's a, that's a kind of thing that, that, that definitely that comes from, from a lot of that. There was, I have not checked it recently, there, there's a wonderful service of a, of a database that someone had put together for some time. It was actually a wonderful uh, database of women in science across a wide range of different fields who were willing to speak about a lot of, of things. I do not remember what <laughs> the name of that was, but that was definitely something that I had used um, for a while, too. Sometimes I'll just sit on Twitter and find people. Yeah. Like Sometimes that's just your best resource. Yeah. I mean, because a lot of people with extensive backgrounds in different um, in different parts of the country even um, are out there sharing what they've worked on, what their opinions are on certain things, and they might become the best sources or the best folks to write stories. One thing you can do when you're talking to somebody who has a, an idea about something is to just say, who disagrees with you about this? Mm -hmm. yeah. let's, let's go on. Uh, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Anel, and I'm a PhD student at the J School. Um, oh. And and may I say, Amel is going to be the TA for this course in the summer. Um, I was wondering about like covering science as a field of expertise, like how hard it must be to cover stories of, that you don't know much about because you're not uh, researchers yourself, apart from you, Dr. Timur. Um, so how, what, what is a good skill to have to, to talk about science and uh, without being an expert of it? Get comfortable with it? <laughs> Corey had, Corey sort of raised her hand and to the question of what is a good skill for a science journalist to have when you can't possibly know all of the science? I, 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 I would just say when you're interviewing someone and you don't know anything about it, you can't, don't worry about creating the impression in the mind of the person you're interviewing that you are a dunce. Ask whatever questions you want to ask. If you don't understand the answer, I mean, there are tricks of eliciting an answer out of your source that you understand and that you think your readers or your audience will understand. Um, but the point of the process is not for you to impress the person you're interviewing with the brilliance of you. It's okay if the person you're interviewing, after you've asked him all your simple questions, leaves and says, what a dim bulb that woman is. 
Let them be impressed with your ignorance when you interview them, as long as they will be dazzled by the brilliance of your story when, you, when your story appears. And it's another way of just saying you're, the, the person you need to be concerned about is not your source, it's your audience. This is what I do. <laughs> so, yes. And I once interviewed someone, what turned out to be a really fun story, a good story, and about a, uh, the physics of beaches. And I said, can you explain this uh, phenomenon in simple terms? And he said, no. No, it's blah, 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 blah. And he said, no, 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 it's some ad of, uh, you know, some total mouthful of gobbledy book, which I completely didn't understand. I said, oh, in other words, it's this, 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 and this. No, 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 we went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until pretty soon we got to a place where I understood what he was talking about. And when I said it back to him, in my words, it was good enough for him to, you know, bite the bullet and say, yes, that's right. You can say it like that. I, I know somebody who intentionally gives researchers bad translations of, of what they said to them in an effort to induce them to explain it on a simpler level. One of the things I always did uh, when talking to Nobel Prize winning physicists or mathematicians, God help me, um, <laughs> was I'd say, could you explain to me in the way you might talk to a bright 12 year old, <laughs> a, a nice junior high school student, explain it in that way. And often they would. Um, as long as one didn't pretend one understood the stuff when you don't. Um, you're, you're, not, you're not there to impress them. You're there to get them to give you what you need. Another thing is you have to notice that you are not understanding it because when someone's talking to you very animatedly about their work, you might feel like you're swept along in what they were saying, and then they're like, wait, what was that? You're editing, you know, you're going back to look over what you wrote, or what someone else wrote as an editor, like realizing that even though it read really nicely, you have no idea what it said, which is, by the way, something that also happens a lot <laughs> with um, generative AI. It sounds completely plausible, but if you read it with like an editor's eye, it, it doesn't doesn't line up and like learning figuring that out as soon as possible preferably while you're still talking to the scientists is really important to then come off as the dimple and ask them again uh, to clarify but don't leave the interview without getting them to tell you where they can be reached that too <laughs> and make sure that um they know how to reach you because sometimes that will occur to them i should have told her and make sure they're able to tell you that, whatever that thing is that they forgot to tell you. And these days, one must get a cell phone number, not just an office number, because nobody answers <coughs> the office number. Uh, gentlemen back there, and then we're going to kind of call it anything. You are. I'm Ben Woolman. I'm a recent, uh, relatively recent college graduate. Um, Columbia, um, and I'm wondering, you know, we talk about science, it's such an iterative process, and I'm just wondering if you could speak a little towards um, the, the newsroom tools and um, opportunities that you take uh, to reflect and, and iterate and, and look back on work. I, I know, like, during the editorial process, you're making sure perspectives are taken into account. How much of that takes place after, you know, in such fast-paced newsrooms? Where are there opportunities to look back and 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 do better and be more inclusive and and just uh, upgrade uh, going forward? Um, so we still have a comment section. We it requires heavy moderation to keep it from being insane. Yeah, <laughs> but you know I go back and read one or two pages of the comments because. If there is a paragraph that one person didn't get, it's not a big deal. But if three or four people are saying, yeah, that didn't make sense to me, or occasionally we'll get actual scientists saying what it really meant was, and you, know, <coughs> you, could, you can learn what you're doing for they Yeah, I think, I think um, you know, it's, it's not the best tool, but seeing what people are tweeting about your story, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, it can sort of, you know, get the sense that you've maybe like highlighted the wrong thing 
um, you know, other times it can, it can confirm to you that actually you've, you've, you've highlighted the right thing because the right people are upset about it. <laughs> <laughs> in our news, are we need for on headlines. Um, at least once a week, we look back at the previous week to see what stories performed well and which didn't. And then we might talk about, like, oh, this might have worked better if we would used a different headline. People, like, I didn't even understand what you were talking about with that story and, you know, sort of having those internal conversations. Um, because it is a team, you know, you were talking earlier about it being teamwork and, like, really working with your colleagues. Like, we do a lot of workshopping for headlines and things like that. Yeah, there's always a lot of discussion, formal and informal, about what's worked and what hasn't worked. And so, you know, Many of us who are editors have editors of our own who sometimes scrutinize our, our own work and they have their own opinions at times about whether or not I was in fact as brilliant as I thought I was, <laughs> which is almost always the case. <laughs> and yet, sometimes. Well, on that note, on the idea that even editors have editors, <laughs> that's very reassuring to those of us who submit to editors. Um, <laughs> I would like to thank all of you for participating in our experiment tonight. The central question we were asking was, would people come out to a meeting in person <laughs> and um, behave as we did before the pandemic? And the answer is, you've been great. You've asked brilliant questions. Uh, you stimulated all of us up here. And you sat for two hours with good manners and good <laughs> ideas. So it was a, a successful experiment in every possible way. We thank you. Um, students, next week, your first draft of your final term project. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you then. And um, thank you so much for coming.